Good morning. Welcome to Christian Family Church of Santa Maria, California. If you'd like to listen to more of our messages, you can go to YouTube. And once you're there, if you'll type in the search line, one word, starting with a capital C, Christian Family 324. This evening, we're going to be studying Acts chapter 23. And before we do, I'd like you to pray with me. Father, thank you for this time we can spend together this evening as we study your word. Thank you, Lord, that you tell us that your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Lord, if ever we needed light, if ever we needed direction, it is now. So I pray in Jesus' name that we will have an ear to hear and a heart to obey the things that we hear today from your word. Holy Spirit, I know that you teach us as your word goes forth, even as you promise that it is an understander or a discerner of the thoughts and intents of our heart. So help us today as we study this scripture, help us to glean what we can use for this particular time in our lives. We'll thank you and praise you, Father, in Jesus' holy name, amen. Amen. Acts chapter 23, verses 1 through 11. The apostle Paul, earnestly looking at the council, said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. And the high priest Ananias commanded those who stood by him to smite him, to hit Paul on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God will smite you, thou whitted wall, for you sit to judge me after the law, and you command me to be smitten contrary to the law. And they that stood by said, Is this the way? You revile God's high priest? Paul said, I did not know, brethren, that he was the high priest, for it is written, Thou shalt not speak evil of the ruler of thy people. But when Paul perceived that one part were Sadducees and the other part were Pharisees, he cried out in the council and said, Men and brethren, I am a Pharisee. I am the son of a Pharisee. Of the hope and resurrection of the dead, I am being called into question. Verse 7 says, And when he had said so, there arose a dissension between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the multitude was divided. Because the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, neither angel or spirit. But the Pharisees confess both angels and resurrection. Verse 9. So there arose a great cry, and the scribes that were of the Pharisees' part, arose and, and strove or argued, saying, We find no evil in this man, but if a spirit or an angel is spoken to him, let us not fight against God. And when there arose a great dissension, the chief captain, fearing that Paul would have been pulled into pieces by them, commanded the soldiers to go down and take him by force from among them and to bring him back into the castle. And the night following, the Lord stood by Paul and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as you have testified of me in Jerusalem, so you must also bear witness at Rome. Wow, what a great story. Here's the Apostle Paul standing before the council of the Jews, and he recognizes that they're divided in their beliefs. Uh, I had a pastor tell me one time that the Sadducees don't believe in the resurrection and that's why they're sad you see and that's the way I remember sad you sees the Pharisees think they're fairer than all and so but the Pharisees did believe in the resurrection and angels so let's go back and take a look at this passage of scripture where God gives Paul great wisdom in immediately siding with the Pharisees causing there to be a division among them and therefore it broke down their unity of coming against him for preaching the gospel So in verse 1, the Apostle Paul reports to the Jews that he has a good conscience before God. So let's talk about that. If you'll turn with me to Hebrews chapter 8, the book of Hebrews chapter 8, I want to speak on having a good conscience before God. And I think the only way you can really have a good conscience before God is not to please men, but rather please the Lord. It's Him that we serve. It's him that we live and have our being. So if you're going to have a good conscience, have a good conscience before the Lord. It doesn't matter what you do. You're not going to make everyone happy. Everyone has got an opinion. So it's best to just please God 
And those who love God will love you. Those who don't love God won't love you no matter what you do. So the Apostle Paul reports to the Jews he had his good conscience. In Hebrews chapter 8, verses 10 through 12, God says this. This is the covenant, and of course we know that a covenant is a promise that God makes that can never be broken. So this is a covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind or into their spirit. And I will write them on their hearts and I will be to them a God and they will be to me a people. This is where we get a conscience from is that God puts his laws in our mind. Verse 11. And they will not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother saying know the Lord for all shall know me from the least unto the greatest for I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. In that he says a new covenant has he made the first one old. Now that which is decaying and becoming old is ready to vanish away. Of course he's speaking of the law. The law being vanished away because Christ fulfilled the law and now we're in the age of grace where Christ has paid for our sins and we have to have faith and believe in the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ and the shed blood that he paid to pay for our sins. So in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, if you'll turn there with me, 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 12. Paul explains his plans by saying this, Our rejoicing is this, the testimony of our conscience, that in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God, we have had our conduct in the world and even more abundantly towards you. So Paul, again, was telling the Corinthians, I have a good conscience in that I have ministered to you and my, my heart was more abundantly towards you. And then in 1 Timothy, and all the T's in the New Testament are together, about two-thirds of the way through the New Testament, you'll find all the T's, Thessalonians, Timothy, and Titus. So in 1 Timothy chapter 1, and verse 5, Paul writes this to Timothy. Now the end of the commandment is love, out of a pure heart and a good conscience, and faith unfeigned or unswerved. So Paul again talks about a good conscience, and he reports this to the Jews, that his conscience is clear. In verse 2, the scripture tells us in Acts chapter 23 that the high priest reacts to Paul's testimony and had him struck or hit on the mouth. So I want to take a look at some other examples in John chapter 18. If you'll turn to the book of John in the 18th chapter, starting with verse 19. This is when Jesus was betrayed and arrested and stood before the high priest. And verse 19 picks it up. The high priest then asked Jesus about his disciples and about his teachings, his doctrine. Verse 20, Jesus answered him, I spoke openly to the world. I always taught in the synagogue and in the temple where the Jews always resort. And in secret, I have said nothing. Why are you asking me? Ask the ones who heard me what I have said to them. Behold, they know what I said. In verse 22, the Bible says, When he had thus spoken, one of the officers which stood by struck Jesus with the palm of his hand and said, Are you answering the high priest in such a manner? Verse 23, Jesus answered him, If I have spoken evil, then you can bear witness of the evil. But if I have spoken well, why are you hitting me? The Bible says, now Annas had sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. So Jesus was smitten on the mouth as well for speaking the truth. And I want to speak to you a word of encouragement. We live in a world that doesn't want to hear the truth. The Bible tells us in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, because they will not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved, God will send them a strong delusion and they'll believe the lie. 
And you could almost say they'll believe the lie instead of the truth. So this, Jesus told us in John chapter 8, the truth will set us free. But there are people in our world today who don't want to hear the truth. And sometimes you'll get hit, if you don't physically get hit on the mouth, you'll get hit with words against you when you speak the truth. Let's take a look at 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter and the third chapter. Right after the book of James. 1 Peter chapter 3 and starting with verse 14. Peter speaks to the church through the power of the Holy Spirit and says this, 1 Peter 3.14 If you suffer for righteousness sake happy are you don't be afraid of their terror neither be troubled but set apart the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks the reason of the hope that's within you with meekness and fear having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you like evildoers, that they may be ashamed who falsely accuse your good conduct in Christ. For it is better, Peter writes, if the will of God be so that you suffer for well-doing and not for evil-doing. So I think it's important to understand that when we do well, when we speak the truth, when we confront the evil that's in our land, we're going to suffer persecution for it. That's what the Bible teaches. That's what Jesus went through, and that's what we'll go through as well. It's what the Apostle Paul went through. It's what Jesus Christ went through. Even John and Peter were hit and beaten because of speaking the truth. So in verses 3 through 5, Paul tells the Jews that he didn't know the one who ordered him to be hit was the high priest. So let's take a look at where Paul was coming from when he said, the law says not to revile the high priest. Let's take a look at Exodus chapter 22, the second book in the Old Testament, Genesis and then Exodus, the 22nd chapter and verse 28. The scripture says, Thou shalt not revile the gods nor curse the ruler of thy people. So Paul was going by the law that says not to curse the ruler of of your people. Romans chapter 13 goes further into the fact that we should obey those who have the rule over us. And I think there's only one exception to that, which is all throughout Scripture, when people were ordered to disobey God, instead they disobeyed the authority over them in order to obey God. And we have examples in the Scripture. First of all, Moses with Pharaoh. Then we have Daniel who was thrown into the lion's den because he prayed against the king's order. And then we have Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who, uh, and also in the book of Daniel, who uh, made the decision not to worship the golden idol that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. They were actually thrown into the fiery furnace because of their refusal to obey an unjust law, an unlawful order to worship an idol when God commands us not to worship idols. So there's many more uh, examples in Scripture, Peter, James, John, so many other examples, including Jesus Christ. So there is a time to obey the rulers, however, and Romans 13 discusses that, and it says this, Let every soul be subject to the higher powers, for there is no power but of God, and the powers that are ordained of God. Whoever resists the power then resists the ordinance of God, and they who resist will receive to themselves judgment. Because rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil works. And I want to park right there. I will refuse to obey an unlawful order. You see, God says, don't forsake the gathering of yourselves together as the manner of some is, but you are to exhort one another, Christians, and so much the more as you see that day of Christ approaching. Yet we've been ordered by our governor and by other leaders to close all the churches, and I, I think it's really laughable that liquor stores remain open, that Walmart and Costco and all these other places remain open, but churches are demanded to be closed. 
I think that's hypocrisy. I think it's an unlawful order. I think it's asking us to disobey our God. And God says, those who disobey him will not have favor when it comes to eternal life. The scripture says God is angry with the wicked every day. Psalm 711. And the only way to escape God's wrath is through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. So he goes on to say, they are not a terror to good works, but to evil works. In our land, we're suffering for good works. The evil works are being promoted. People are tearing down stores, lighting fires, defunding the police, turning over police cars, killing innocent people. Nothing's being done at all for that. But the scripture prophesies of that in Isaiah chapter 5, where the scripture says, they will call evil good and good evil. They will put light for darkness and darkness for light and sweet for bitter and bitter for sweet. In other words, they'll reverse everything that's right and make dark light and light dark. They'll place evil as good and good as evil. And that's exactly what we're seeing in our land today. The scripture says they are a minister of God to you for good. But if you do that which is evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. I have several law enforcement uh, officers who are friends of mine, and they tell me their hands are so tied now that they can't really even arrest anyone unless it's a serious crime. For instance, if you go shoplifting and you just walk out of the store with whatever you want to walk out of the store with, first of all, the store owners now, their hands are tied. They can't chase after you or physically try to stop you in any way. And all they can do is call the police. And if you're unlucky enough to not leave the parking lot before the police get there, they can't arrest you. All they can do now is write you a ticket. Evil is good, good is evil. It's all through our land. The scripture says in verse 5, you must needs to be subject not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. For this cause you are to pay tribute also, for they are God's ministers attending continually upon this very thing. So you are to render, therefore, to all their dues. Tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom is due, fear to whom fear is due, and honor to whom honor is due. Owe no man anything but love one another, for he that loves has fulfilled the law. That's a challenging scripture in today's landscape in our land. In verses 6 through 8, Paul uses wisdom to divide the opinion of the council. Remember, half were Sadducees, they don't believe in the resurrection. Half were Pharisees, they believe in the resurrection. So in Matthew chapter 22, if you'll turn there with me, Matthew the 22nd chapter, we're going to read 10 verses. Matthew, the 22nd chapter, starting with verse 23. The same day the, the Sadducees came to Jesus, they say that there's no resurrection, and they asked him, saying, Master, Moses said if a man dies and has no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up seed or children to his brother. So now they give him a story, verse 25, there were with us seven brethren, and the first one had married a wife, he died, and had no issue, he left his wife to his brother. Likewise, the second one also, and the third, even unto the seventh. Last of all, the woman died also. And therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife shall she be of the seven? Because they all had her. Jesus answered and said unto them, and I love this scripture, You do err, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. I believe one of the quickest ways to make fatal mistakes in this world is to not know the scriptures. To not know the scriptures. Especially if you claim to be a born-again Christian, if you're devoid of understanding of the scriptures, you should be silent and learn and study until you're able to give an answer to every man according to the hope that's within you. Verse 30. In the resurrection, they neither marry or are they given in marriage, but they are like the angels of God in heaven. But as touching the resurrection of the dead, 
Have you not read that which was spoken unto you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and the God of Jacob? God is not the God of the dead. He's the God of the living. And when the multitude heard this, they were astonished at his teaching. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the Apostle Paul gets into the same discourse with those who don't believe in the resurrection. He addresses the church in Corinth by saying this, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and the first 22 verses. Listen to how Paul addresses the subject of the resurrection of Christ. He says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preach to you, which you have also received, and in that you stand, by which you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preach to you, unless you have believed in vain. Verse 3, For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. That's the Gospel, brethren, found in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. The death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. The Apostle Paul said in Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it, the gospel, is the power of God to save everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So it's God's gospel that has the power to save. Just like 1 Peter tells us in 1 Peter, uh, he, he tells us that we are not born again by corruptible seed, but by incorruptible seed, by the word of God that lives and abides forever. We're born again by the word, the gospel. He goes on to say in verse 5 that Jesus was seen by Peter and then by the twelve. And after that, he was seen of above 500 brethren at one time, of whom the greater part remain unto this present time, but some had fallen asleep. After that, Jesus was seen of James and then by all the apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me also. Paul speaks that because he saw him in the spirit in heaven as one born out of due time. Verse 9. For I am the least of the apostles that am not meet or I am not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet it wasn't I, but it was the grace of God which was with me. Therefore, whether it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. Now, if Christ has preached that he rose from the dead, how are there some among you that say there is no resurrection of the dead? If there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ had not risen. And if Christ had not risen, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith also is in vain. Yes, and we would be found to be false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Jesus Christ, whom if he raised him not, if it so be that the dead raise not. For if the dead don't rise, then Christ isn't raised either. And if God isn't raised... If Christ isn't raised, your faith is in vain, and you are yet in your sins. Then they also who have fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life we, we have hope in Christ only, we are of all men most miserable. But now Christ has risen from the dead and has become the firstfruits of those who slept. For since by man came death, and that's Adam, by man also, that's Jesus, came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterwards those who are Christ's at his coming. So in verse 9, Paul's words about the resurrection in Acts chapter 23, verse 9, all of Paul's words cause a great uproar among the people. Remember again, Sadducees on one side, Pharisees on the other side. So in Hebrews chapter 4, we want to talk about why God's word causes such an uproar. Well, first of all, in 1 John chapter 1, 
in verse 5, the Bible says that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. So when you shine the light in the dark, people have a tendency to cover their eyes because they're blinded by the light. That's exactly what sin is as well. When you shine the light on sin, it causes people to recoil, especially those who are not pointed towards the truth. It causes them to recoil. Here's what the scripture says, Hebrews chapter 4, starting with the verse 12. For the word of God is quick. That word means alive. The word of God is alive. It's powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit. In other words, God's word goes right between where your soul and your spirit meet. And it goes to the joints and the marrow, and it's a discerner or an understander of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Verse 13 says, Neither is there any creature that is not that is not shown up or come to the surface or manifest in his sight. But all things are naked and open to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. Paul speaks, an argument happens, Paul holds fast to what he spoke. I believe The scripture teaches, let our yes be yes and our no be no. God hates wavering. He says that a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. And he that wavers is like a wave of the sea, which is driven with the wind and tossed. Let not that man think that he shall receive anything from the Lord. Then he goes on in James chapter 1 to say, a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. There was a great uproar because of the truth being spoken. So let's take a look at John chapter 8, where Jesus spoke the word to the Pharisees, and what an uproar that caused. John chapter 8, starting with verse 42. Verse 42 says, Now Jesus said unto them, the Jews, the Pharisees, If God were your father... You would love me, because I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither did I come of myself, but he sent me. Why don't you understand my speech? Even because you cannot hear my word. And Jesus goes on to say to the Pharisees in verse 44, Because you were of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and did not abide in the truth because there's no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of of, of his own because he is a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. He goes on to say, Which of you convinces me of sin? If I say the truth, why don't you believe me? And then he ends his discourse with them by saying this, He that is of God hears God's words. You, therefore, do not hear them, because you are not of God. You know, that's a clear sign of being born again. You're open to hear God's word. You're open to allow God to judge your heart and judge your motives and judge your spirit and judge your works through his word. Those who resist the word are not of God. That's what Jesus said. Verse 10 Once more, remember Paul was beat up, dragged out by the soldiers, put in the castle, brought back out to speak to him again in earlier chapters, beat up again, they took him back, and now this is the third time that he's standing before the Jews again. Once more, God protects the Apostle Paul by having him removed from the angry crowd. God's protection is over his flock, over his sheep. If you're a born-again believer... You love the Lord, God will protect you. Let's take a look at that. Psalm 91, verses 1 through 4. I like what Isaiah 54, 17 says. No weapon that is formed against you will prosper, but every tongue that rises up against you in judgment, thou shalt condemn. That is our heritage as servants of the Lord, and our righteousness comes from him saith the Lord. And that's Isaiah 54, 17. Let's take a look at Psalm 91, the first four verses. 
The scripture says, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High will abide under the shadow of the Almighty. The secret place of God our Father is the Lord Jesus Christ. Psalm 25, 14 says, The secret of the Lord is with those who fear Him, and He will show them His covenant. And of course, we know God's covenant is to bring us eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. He is the secret place of God. So he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High will abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge, my hiding place. He is my fortress. He is my God, and in Him will I trust. Surely He will deliver you from the snare of the fowler. I like that God used the word surely and not maybe or possibly. Surely God will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the noise and pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you will trust. His truth will be your shield and your buckler. Do you believe? Do you believe God's promise? Let's go back to verse 3. Verse 3 says, God will deliver you from the snare of the fowler. Trust me, brethren, there are many snares out there today. Many snares. But notice that also God says he will deliver you from the noisome pestilence, which is disease. God says he'll deliver you. Do you believe him? Or are you running in fear like most of the rest of the world who's running around in paranoia? People don't even say hello to each other in the grocery store. They're wearing masks so that they'll have to shut up, do their shopping, and leave. It's unbelievable the amount of fear that is in our world right now. We do not walk in fear, brethren. God hasn't given us a spirit of fear. He's given us power, love, and a sound mind. Let me put it more plainly. You either believe God's word or you don't. You either believe the truth or you believe a lie. Your choice. Psalm 27, verses 1 through 6 Do we believe God's word or do we believe others' words? I think most people in America are believing doctors who are at best practicing instead of the great physician who actually created us. So look at Psalm 27 verses 1 through 6. Again, you either believe God's word or you believe the lie. Your choice. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even my enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though an army would encamp against me, my heart will not fear Even if war rises up against me in this one thing, will I be confident. One thing have I desired of the Lord. That will I seek after. And what is that one thing? Verse 4 says, That I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, and to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in His temple. For in the time of trouble, He will hide me in His pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle, he will hide me and he will set me upon a rock. And now my head will be lifted up above my enemies. Round about me, therefore, will I offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. I will sing, yea, I will sing praises unto the Lord. I want to go back to verse 5 and tell you a story. For in the time of trouble... God will hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me, and he will set me upon a rock. The scripture says in verse 4, the verse before that, One thing have I desired of the Lord, and that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. All the days of my life on earth, and then all the days of my life in heaven. So I did a funeral back in 1983 for a motorcycle friend of mine who was murdered in a bar. He was shot in the forehead and killed. I was asked by the vice president of that outlaw motorcycle club if I would do his funeral. And I told him, yes, I would. 
And I happened to know this man who was shot, and he, he had turned his heart towards the Lord. In fact, the next day, the, day, the night that he got shot, it was the next day that he was going to leave town and go back to Oklahoma and join his sister's church and become part of the worship band. So his heart was turned towards the Lord. Unfortunately, the enemy stole his life from him. He visited a bar to be with his friends for his last night here in Santa Maria, and he was murdered. So when I did that funeral, I stood upon a dirt mound next to the hole that they had dug in the ground for his casket. And when I was done preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and talking about the resurrection of the dead and how that those who believed in Christ would rise up in the air to meet the Lord in the clouds and so should they ever be with the Lord. And I preached the gospel, how that Christ died for our sins, how that he was buried and how that he rose from the dead and how he had given us new life by shedding his blood to pay for our sins. There were about 400 outlaw motorcycle people there from all the different gangs around California. There were also a couple of hundred policemen there as well to make sure that there was peace among the crowd. It was interesting, after I finished the sermon, this man came up to me. He had to be six foot six because I was standing on a dirt mound and he was looking at me directly in my eyes. I'm 5'10". I think that mound was... Oh, between 8 and 10 inches tall. So he was looking directly into my eyes. He stared at me for about 15 seconds with his arms crossed. And he looked at me. And then after just a few seconds, he said to me, I wish to God I had the peace that you have. And then he turned around and walked away. It was a very profound moment in my life. Um, I, I wanted to go after him and... and share more with him about the Lord. But God stopped me in my tracks and just spoke to my heart and said, he's already heard the gospel. He wishes he had the peace that you have, but he's made his decision to walk away. And I say to you today, you that hear my voice, you have a decision to make. You either believe in the Lord Jesus Christ or you don't. You either believe his word or you doubt his word. If you're truly born again, the Holy Spirit of God will witness to you in your spirit that God's word is true. Surely he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. That's up to you to believe that promise in Psalm 27. As we close this evening, I want to take a look at verse 11 in Acts chapter 23. The Bible tells us in verse 11 and the night following this time that Paul spoke to the Jews. The Lord stood by him. And he said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as you have testified of me in Jerusalem, so also you must bear witness of me also at Rome. And I thought it was really encouraging because oftentimes when you speak the truth, when you teach the truth, you get attacked. That's just part of the course of being in ministry. You'll be attacked by those who hate God and those who don't believe God. They will come against you. But I love it that God stands with us. He will stand with us who preach and teach the truth of God and those of us who believe his word, born again believers, God will stand with you. The scripture said the Lord stood by the apostle Paul and comforted him. So I want to read some scriptures to you as we close this evening to encourage you in the Lord. I know it's a discouraging time. I know there are a lot of people who are really discouraged about all the different things that have been put upon them. And you know, it reminds me of the story of how to boil a frog. And I, I learned that story some 30 years ago. And someone asked me, how would you boil a frog? And I said, well, I think first of all, you'd you'd, you know, dissect him, take all of his innards out, and then put him in a boiling pot of water. And they said, no, I'm talking about how would you boil a living frog? How would you do it? And I said, well, I would suppose if you put him in hot water, he's just going to react and jump right back out. And, and the man said, that's true. First, you put him in cold water. Then you turn up the flame just a little bit. To where when he starts feeling a little bit of warmth, it just relaxes him. And he becomes comfortable and relaxed. 
And then you turn it up a little bit more and he begins to notice that things are changing, but he's too relaxed to really make a move and jump out of the pot. And you continue to turn up the fire until it's so hot it begins to boil. And that's how you boil a frog. And I think what's happened in our society lately is the boiling of a frog. I believe they started out slow. You have to wear this. You can't go here. You have to separate. You can't speak. You've got to wear this. We're going to give you a vaccine. We're going to... I'm telling you that we are being boiled and many of us don't even know it. We are being boiled like the frog. So I want to encourage you with these scriptures this morning, because, this evening, because I know that many that I've spoken to in the last few weeks are very, very discouraged about what's happening in our country with our First Amendment. Our First Amendment rights have been taken away. Freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom to gather together peaceably. Oh, those who want to gather together for riots and protests, they're allowing that all over the country. But if you want to gather together peaceably to worship God, no, no, that's, that's dangerous. That's dangerous. Wake up, America. Wake up. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5 says this, Let your conduct be without covetousness, and be content with such things as you have. For he, that's God, has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. I think about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. Jesus never left them. He was with them in the fire. Even King Nebuchadnezzar saw Jesus in the fire with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, just like King Nebuchadnezzar saw that Jesus had been with Daniel in the lion's den. And Jesus will be with us. He promises us this in verse 6, so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, and I shall not fear what man shall do unto me. Hang on to that promise. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. 2 Corinthians 1, verses 3 and 4. The Apostle Paul writes the church in Corinth, the second letter, and says, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble by the same comfort with which we ourselves have been comforted by God. As God comforts us, God wants us as believers to comfort others. And I believe that's the way out of depression and so many conditions that are happening right now to people upon this earth. It's the way out to have the mind of Christ, to minister to others, to reach out to someone else and encourage someone else with the same encouragement that you've received. And then finally in closing, 1 Peter chapter 1. So if you go past the book of Hebrews and James, you'll get to 1 Peter the first chapter, 1 Peter chapter 1. Peter writes in verse 3, Blessed be God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. One of the things we need to remember, this life on this earth will soon end. Eternal life will be forever and ever and ever. Psalm 16 says, in his presence is fullness of joy, and at his right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Verse 4 says, we have been ordained to an incorruptible inheritance that's undefiled, that will not fade away. And the fact is, it's reserved in heaven for you. Who's you? If you're a believer, you truly are born again. That promise is for you. You have a reservation in heaven with the Lord God and, and the Lord Jesus Christ. You have a reservation in heaven for eternal life. Verse 5. You are kept by the power of God. And it's through faith. So if you want to be kept, you're going to have to believe. Because the Bible says we are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Brethren, I think if there were ever going to be the last time, we're in the last time now. Verse 6 says, 
wherein you should greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if needs be, you were in heaviness through many temptations or trials. I want to read that verse again. Because of all these promises that God has given us, we should greatly rejoice even now for a season, if need be, we're in heaviness through many trials and temptations because we have a home in heaven for eternity. I pray you'll be blessed with this word. God bless you. I hope your evening is blessed. And let's close in prayer. Father God, thank you for the time we could spend together this evening. I ask that you bless this word, that it would go out to encourage those who are discouraged, that it would cause conviction to those who don't know you, and that many would turn to you and receive you as Lord and Savior. So we thank you for your goodness, Father. We thank you that you keep us by the power of God through faith unto salvation, which you promise is going to be revealed in this last time. So we stand with you, Lord. We stand for you. And we give you all praise and glory in Jesus' holy name. Amen. God bless you and thank you for joining us. Good evening.